turn my bright light off. Okay. Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the third Wednesday of the month, which means it's time for Dr. Stefan Esser. And today he's going to be talking about heart disease, heart disease 101. Please welcome him to the show. It's so nice to see you. You look fit, trim, and young and tan like the, the boy. Oh, well, thank you very much. Is that good living? What can I say? The living that we want to invite all of you into that yeah. healthy, vital life. So you, let's. Uh... You look like you're barely out of college. Oh, well, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, so you, you, do you have any siblings? Mm, I do. Yeah, I'm the youngest, and uh, so I do. How many? Four. And yeah. do they all do they all have the healthy glow, and do they all practice what your grandfather taught? They all do. Yes. There's uh, you know a little bit of this, a little of that sneaking in here and there, but nobody has veered far from the path. And That's uh, you know, it's, uh, I mean, when you grow up experiencing how good you can feel, and then also when you eat unwell, how horribly you feel. And when you see so many people get healthy, like they did at my grandfather's ranch, how can you not, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's just such a powerful motivator. Did any of the sheep stray from the flock at all? Uh, no, not really. I mean, all the people, like all my siblings, my cousins, you know, uh, they, you know, some of them got into a little bad, you know, or less than ideal health habits. And then they would, you know, come right back, you know, kind of experiencing the, the ill health effects. So, but yeah. It's just amazing how it makes a difference how you raise your kids. Well, and that's the beauty of the message to all of your viewers, isn't it? Right? The choices that you're making today may not, in fact, even be for you. They may be for three generations or four generations later that your impact can be that radical, like my great, great grandfather was, right? For all these years later, for all of us. How do you turn the ship around, though? So, so the thing is, is mo I would I would venture to guess that most people that are watching this, or most people that follow me, they weren't raised like you, and they right. struggle because their husband's not on board. It's usually yep. the husband. No offense, but that's how it is. Their kids were raised. You know, once you give a kid like sugar and junk, it is so hard to get them to eat kale. That's right. That's right. And so I think the reality we need to all face is that it's a challenge, but that doesn't mean that it's not worth it. That's the thing to remember. Just like it may be a challenge to get your master's degree or MD or PhD or write a book as Chef AG has written many, those are all challenges, but they're worth those challenges because of the potential benefit to yourself, to society, to your you know, significant others, to your social circles. The list goes on to the planetary health, the animals, right? Especially when it comes to this healthy behaviors. So nobody said this was easy. We just said it was simple, two very different things. And arguably it is absolutely 1000% worth it. So, right. you know, whether it's, whether it's by, you know, hook or cranny or, you know, whatever the phrase is, right. Whatever, whatever it takes to make it happen is worth it. And you're worth it. All of you viewers out there. So just keep reminding yourself of that. And when you have an unhealthy moment, you do something unhealthy. It's just that it's an unhealthy decision. Now get back to the healthy decisions. Don't beat yourself up. Don't think you're a failure. Don't, you know, just degrade yourself and all this ridiculous negative self-talk and I'll never be able to do it. It's too hard. No, no, that's not, none of that's true. And it's worth it. You know, so I had my great grandfather who really brought my whole family into this movement. Um, and then my grandfather became one of the leaders of this movement, right? More than 75 years ago. Um, had they all said it was too hard and nothing would have happened, right? For our family, for hundreds tens of you know, thousands of patients, you know, nothing would have happened throughout human history. If every great person right. leader would have said, you know what, you know, George Washington crossing the Delaware, I'm tired. Yeah. It's too yeah. hard. You are and back the boat up. That's right. And so all the people out there who come up with the various and different excuses, they are real. They are true challenges. Acknowledge that, but then come up with the answer and solve it. Yeah. You can do it. And, you, and we you, can help. I, you know, if you didn't become a doctor, do you think you would have been a minister or a pastor? You're just, I just, I just always get pumped up when I hear you speak. Good. Well, that's why I'm here for you, Chef AJ. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, heart disease, timely. I mean, it's, the, do it. it, it's still number one, right? In terms of how many still people. Still numero uno. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Let's everybody, hit it. Everybody's got a heart. Well, most That's people. it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> here we go. Heart disease 101, friends. Coming to you live from Jacksonville, Florida. We are going to talk about the number one killer. You know, every 37 seconds, someone keels over and doesn't go well. Not cool. Not what we want for them. No, no, no. 
We want them to be healthy and vital. We want you to be healthy and vital. So during my talk, there are going to be dozens upon dozens of people, unfortunately, in America who are going to die of a heart attack. So today I'm going to take you to a mini medical school. We're going to visit the market. We're going to put it all together. And we're going to try to give you tools and tips to be successful long term to have a healthier heart. Let's start with the mini medical school. You know, heart disease can include things like heart attacks, heart abnormal rhythms, heart valve problems, right? Any of the above. But the predominant thing we're going to talk about today is coronary artery disease. This coronary artery disease is the number one cause of death in women. Take a look. Breast cancer in yellow, heart disease in blue. The number one cause of death in men, prostate cancer in blue, heart disease there. So yeah, it's sexy. It's needed. It's required. It's valuable to sit around and talk about other diseases because they can still get us. But you should not be talking nearly as much about any other disease as you should about heart disease. If you're going to really spend your time talking about what's most likely to kill you and to kill me. Because it is just so common, the amount of spending is insane. You can see the climb year after year after year after year of the spending on healthcare. As a result, heart disease, let's review, number one cause of death in the US. Heart disease, major cause of healthcare spending. Let's learn more. Your heart itself is pretty amazing. Left side of the chest sits there pumping for you, this beautiful little pump, just pump, 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 pump. Thousands upon thousands upon millions of beats again and again and again, the majority of the time not causing you any problems. When's the last time you said thank you to your heart? The night before you go to bed or even right now while I'm talking, maybe it's time to put your hand on your carotid artery right here at your neck or on your chest or feel it on your radial pulse. Feel that pulse. Listen to it, feel it, and be grateful for the life that you're given. And my challenge to you right now, right, is what are you doing with that life? Are you maximizing what you can do with your life? Or are you minoring in majors and majoring in minors? Yeah. Versus really focusing on what really matters. But that heart itself pumps blood out through the arteries and then back via the veins, right? So the blood travels from the heart, from that right ventricle, it's called, into the lungs, then back into the heart from the lungs after it's been oxygenated. And from the heart, from the left ventricle, out via the aorta, the largest blood vessel in the body. And then that permeates through every square inch of you. I mean, how cool is that, right? My fingertips, right? When's the last time you were like a kid? You should do it later. Take your cell phone light or your flashlight, put it up to your finger at night before you go to bed and look at the red that you see. It's all that blood. It's amazing. Going through every bit, coursing through you. And of course, whatever you eat is coursing through you as well, right along with all that blood that's carrying it everywhere. The first pump, when the blood pumps, when the heart squeezes, the blood flies up into the aorta. And before it goes to the rest of the body, it goes to the heart itself via the arteries that are called the coronary arteries, the crown arteries. They wrap around the heart and they feed it. And this is the heart of the matter when it comes to heart disease, heart attacks is that these blood vessels, these coronary arteries get blocked up. When they get blocked up, you don't get enough blood flow. And then the muscle of the heart dies off. Now, I always thought about arteries and veins. I always thought they were kind of like PVC pipes, just hard, clear things. The blood flowed through, nothing happened. But it turns out the arteries are lined with endothelia, tiny little cells that are very much alive, every single one of them alive, just like your skin cells. And at each of these levels of these endothelial, reactions are occurring. Different chemical sequences are happening as different chemicals are in your bloodstream. The different micronutrients that you consume that get absorbed into your bloodstream all have effect. Pretty amazing when you think about it. So the heart is the body's pump. It propels oxygen and nutrition throughout your body. And the vessels are truly alive. There are chemical reactions, physiologic processes at every split second of your life occurring along the lining of your blood vessels. These blood vessels are crucial. And the clogging up of these blood vessels can occur as a result of various risk factors. There are the non-modifiable ones, right? You should pay attention to these. You should know what they are at least, right? Do you have a personal history? Well, yeah, I've had a heart attack. Well, you have personal history. Are you postmenopausal female? Have you had a history of heart disease in your family? I saw a guy the other day. He said, hey, look, my dad, my uncle, my grandfather, my, his two brothers, they all died before the age of 60 of a heart attack. 
And he goes, I've decided that I don't want that. And I've radically changed my diet. Now here I am, 65. And I'll live them all so far. And I want to keep on going. So it's worthwhile to know your risks, though, because if you have a lot of non-modifiable risks, your risk is much higher. Now, you see, for me, nobody has died of any heart disease in my family for four generations, ever since my family went on a fully strict plant-based diet. That's pretty cool. They have died of other problems, but not of heart disease. And so you want to know your risks. More important, even though, than your non-modifiable are your modifiable ones. What's in your control? Because Chef AJ and I are here. We're not here to talk about esoteric statistics that don't matter to your health. We're here to give you tools to equip you to achieve your best health. You know, I know that Chef Agee's greatest legacy she wants to leave is millions of healthy people. That's what she wants. You know, it's not that she's squirreling away all her millions in a bank account, right? And living in Fiji. She wants to transform lives for good. So the greatest gift you can give Chef Agee and myself is to change these modifiable risk factors in your life. So you just read through them. Now let's talk about each one. Let's start out with our BMI, our waist hip circumference, our visceral fat, our belly fat, our body weight. You have seen these statistics, and this is that by 2030, 50% of the American populace will be obese. And the number one BMI category will be severe obesity in women, low-income adults, and Blacks. This is problematic. This is terrifying. Now, the number one body mass index will be severe obesity. But you and I can change that. You see that severe obesity radically increases your risk of hypertension, congestive heart failure, hyperlipidemia, and a host of other disease processes that increase your risk of heart disease itself. Here you'll see a great example in the AHRQ data from some time past showing this, right? That the more you weigh, the higher your risk of high cholesterol of a heart condition, of course, of diabetes, which increases your risk of heart disease by over 600%. These are all real and true problems. What about type 2 diabetes? We said that was a risk factor for heart disease. It turns out one in nine adults has type 2 diabetes. What about high blood pressure? One in three. What about high cholesterol? One in six. What, you know, what about medication use, right? Medicine uses just go up and up over time. And then we look at smoking, right? <clears throat> Even now today, you'll find that anywhere from 12 to 15% of the populace, 12 to 18% uh, are still smoking. The smoking, of course, damages the lining of the blood vessels. It oxidizes things at the cellular level, and it causes your blood vessels to get smaller. That's how it damages all of your arteries, and it increases your risk of death. Now, cholesterol is a modifiable risk factor, and it's very important for you to understand cholesterol is an important molecule needed for producing your hormones, things like estrogen and testosterone, but it's also important for building your cells. Your cells, you see, have a bilipid membrane. And this membrane around the cells is composed in some portion of the cholesterol. And so these cells have to have some fluidity, some flexibility, so they're not just hard and stiff. So cholesterol is not a bad word. It is an important molecule for human health. When you speak of cholesterol, many people misunderstand LDL and HDL. They think that this is making reference to types of cholesterol. But in reality, it's making reference to proteins that bind to cholesterol. In addition, of course, we have triglycerides, which are those excess calories in meals, and the body converts the excess calories into triglycerides, almost this form of fat, if you will, circulating through the bloodstream. If you want to talk about your cholesterol, which you should, if you care about your heart disease risk, you should know at least what the American Heart Association recommends as a basic. You know, my total cholesterol less than 200, LDL less than 100, HDL more than 40, men, 60 women, and triglycerides less than 150. Now, excuse me. Many fully plant-based individuals find their HDL drops a bit, along with their LDL and total cholesterol. If your total cholesterol is low and your LDL is low, I'm less concerned about what your HDL is. However, if your total cholesterol, LDL are both elevated, then the HDL is important to offset that negative effect of the other two. Keep in mind the fact that cholesterol comes from two sources, either A, produced by your liver, or B, it is found in things that have faces and things that have mothers. That's simple. You've got a face, you've got a mother, you have cholesterol inside of you. So it doesn't matter whether it's chicken, it doesn't matter whether it's fish, it doesn't matter whether it's shrimp, they all have cholesterol. And in fact, when you look at the USDA data, here's a nice slide for you. When you compare 100 grams of these food products, you'll notice in fact that beef and chicken have about the same amount of cholesterol. Now what beef also has is more saturated fat, and that saturated fat drives your liver to produce more cholesterol. 
So not only are you eating cholesterol, but you're driving your liver to produce more cholesterol. So it's a double whammy. And that's why for cholesterol purposes, beef may be a little worse than chicken, but not a lot. And if you look even below that, the individual who is told by the physician to stop eating the red meat and instead they start eating the shrimp, well, their cholesterol may not in fact drop at all. It may stay about the same. This is why individual dots a plant-based program, notice above fruits, nuts, seeds, grains, zero cholesterol, have beautiful drops in cholesterol. So when people, for example, do my four-week nutritional program, on average, their cholesterol reduces 30%. That is a good thing. In just four weeks, a reduction of 30% in total cholesterol. So these cholesterol sources are powerful to negatively affect your cholesterol levels. In addition, they increase the consumption or exposure to advanced glycasylation end products or AGFs, and those are increasing inflammation. As you'll learn later, there are three big risk factors when it comes to atherosclerosis. And that's gonna be elevating the cholesterol, that's gonna be inflammation, and then endothelial damage. You get all three of these, it's a perfect cascade for heart disease. So cholesterol production increases when you consume either saturated fats where the carbon molecule is completely saturated. They're all the four bonds on the carbon are completely full or with trans fats, which you can see with this double bond going a certain direction that then leads to problem. So we've got trans fats, right? With all the fast foods and the junk, the fried foods. We've got saturated fats like the coconut palm oil, et cetera. And then we've got the unsaturated fats. If your goal is your weight loss, all three of these categories of fats should be excluded because they will all slow your weight loss based on a calorie density model. If your goals are to reverse, prevent heart disease, then the majority of these fats should also be avoided as we'll talk about. Coconut oil is wonderful to put on your skin, but not to be put into your mouth, just so we're all on the same page. High blood pressure is another modifiable risk factor. High blood pressure, of course, right, is the amount of pressure inside of a blood vessel. It's pushing from inside out. And when we look at that, a high pressure system, which is the risky system, is going to be where there is more force. Well, notice you can increase force out of a hose by putting your thumb across it, making the opening smaller. That's the same thing with our bodies, right? If anything makes your blood vessels get tighter, well, it's going to increase the pressure inside that blood vessel. Likewise, if you decrease the uh, force around the artery, or if you increase the diameter of the artery with vasodilating substances, the pressure drops. My blood pressure was 116 over 72 today, which is reasonable. And you'd like to see your blood pressures down in the one teens, right? On a regular basis, if not even lower. That is the normal physiologic state of the human at rest. Elevated amounts of pressure are of course health compromising because they lead to a thickening of the wall of the arteries. A hypertensive state chronically causes increased uh, pressure and constriction and hypertrophy of the arteries. So as a result, they get thickened and now the pressure is significantly increased. What about obesity? Well, obesity, as we mentioned, right, you can see that the other risk factors of heart disease, high blood pressure, stroke, diabetes, cancers all go up. And so we really want to make sure that we're addressing this in an appropriate nutrient-dense, calorie-poor way. Atherosclerosis, of course, is the fatty buildup in the blood vessels themselves. This is the heart of the matter. So you take this nice, healthy-looking artery here and you get a little injury to the, the endothelial wall. And now the body begins to store the fat and the cholesterol in that wall. And over time, it progressively builds up and puts you at risk. Here's what I spoke of. These are the three areas that can induce atherosclerosis in your body. You want to eliminate all three. You want to get rid of the high blood pressure by reducing stress, by decreasing salt consumption, by getting your regular exercise, by eliminating the alcohol, but all those great things. By the hypercholesterolemia, you want to reduce that cholesterol through your nutrition, through your exercise, both of which have powerful effects. And the inflammation, really the heart of the matter is nutrient intakes that absorb all the excess inflammatory molecules and over time decreases your body's own production of those molecules. This is how it starts, right? You got this nice artery with the endothelial wall looking clean. Over, you get some little micro injury to it, and now begin to form an atheroma. 
that atheroma or this cholesterol and fat collection in the walls of the artery uh, can either get stable and thickened and be quite safe, or it can rupture because it's a juvenile plaque, we call it. It's not well formed. And all you have to do is run or exercise or get in a stressful environment. And all of a sudden, boom, it goes. It's fun to actually look at the data. I give a talk on this with regards to the effects of emotion on our risk of heart disease. And there are studies that show, for example, in environments where there's increased stress, even let's just say like during the World Cup, when your favorite team is playing in that country, when that country's team is playing, they have a spike in heart attacks. Fascinating. Because as their stress goes up, their blood pressure goes up, this hemodynamic disturbance increases, a little quick, fast blood flow, it rips off the caps of these plaques and boom, they clot off and there's the heart attack. Now, it's very important you and I have a very real conversation. If you're over the age of 10, you have heart disease if you've eaten the standard American diet. What? What are you saying, Dr. Esser? My cholesterol is normal. My blood pressure is normal. I had an EKG and it's normal. Well, that doesn't mean that you don't have heart disease. You see, on average in America, our heart disease starts in our first decade. And for each progressive decade, it gets worse. You've seen the kids at Mickey D's scarfing down their fries in a Chick-fil-A with, you know, and then the blizzard that, you know, Dairy Queen, et cetera. If you engaged in that sort of toxic behavior, you have heart disease. It's very important you're aware of this. It's kind of like the person who's run well water through their house and they go, no, no, <laughs> my house is clean. My pipes are perfectly pristine 20 years later as I've run this well water through. Well, you and I know that's inaccurate. I grew up in a house with well water. And so you've seen it, the residue, the, all the heavy metals, the stuff building up, all the crud. Same thing happens in us. Now I say this because there is this sort of false fixed belief that you and I have. We look around and we go, it's not going to happen to us, please. It's the other guy down the road. It's that really sick person. When the reality is, as I, what did I say to you earlier? Every 37 seconds, someone dies of a heart attack. Not all those people, right? Were these sick, toxic, unwell people who couldn't walk. Very important you're aware of this. This is real stuff, right? And very, 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 very important. Because what you do matters. You see on the left here, you've got a blood vessel that looks quite healthy. And on the right, yeah, looks a little bit, ugh, not ideal. Now, again, you have coronary artery disease if you've eaten the standard American diet, unless you are blessed with some crazy, crazy genetics, which most of us have not been. And the autopsy studies are the clearest studies on this, right? So starting all the way back in the Korean War, then Vietnam, now Bogolasu and PDA studies, all these studies show the same thing. By the age around 20, if you cut someone open and look at their blood vessel, if they've eaten the standard American diet, 80% of the subjects have heart disease you can see with your naked eye. It's right there. Bam, there's your heart disease. Very important. You and I are aware of this. So atherosclerosis begins early in life, progresses with habits and age. And if you've eaten the standard American diet of heart disease, the good news is, as we're going to talk about, though, you can nurture nature. You can change the expression of this hateful disease in your body. What about diabetes? It's a risk factor for heart disease. It turns out it increases your risk of a heart attack by 300 to 600%. And this is why it's, why it's so absolutely essential that you radically change your diabetes risk. Got a family member right now, a distant family member who is not raised eating this way, who developed type 2 diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, uh, cardiac arrhythmias, and a host of other problems. And their blood sugars on average were around 200 every day, all the time, despite multiple medications. And within four days of eating a simple program, my simple four-week program, which they're now doing here at my home, their blood sugars are averaging 100, 102, 103, all their fasting in just four days. So if you yourself are struggling with diabetes, I want to just remind you of how powerful the food is that you eat. What you do can radically alter this like that. So studies, for example, by the Pritikin Institute with micronutrient-dense fiber-rich foods show that 80% of people who consume a plant-based program can be off oral blood sugar medicines in three weeks with normal numbers. And 50% of people on insulin can be off of it, which is pretty dang cool in three weeks in people with type 2 diabetes. Now, exercise is a modifiable risk factor. 150 minutes a week is what we're looking for. You remember my talk not too long ago. 
If you don't, you should go back. It's about three months past. And Chef AJ, Chef AJ and I were jamming about exercise. So go back and watch that one. But physical exercise, whenever somebody recommends something for a disease process, you should say, how's that going to help me? Well, it turns out exercise decreases blood pressure, improves your heart and blood vessel elasticity and ability to react to stress. It lowers your BMI, it increases your HDL, it improves your blood sugars and insulin sensitivity. It has a host of other benefits as well with regards to inflammation and cardiac rhythms, et cetera. Now, nutrition is a strong modifiable risk factor for heart disease. And let's start with fruits and veggies. The American Heart Association recommends at least four and a half cups a day. You know, it's uh, it's a pretty pathetic looking. That's like tiny, a little nothing. Each one of those is four and a half cups a day. Um, and what I would say is the following too. It's quite interesting. Uh, less than 9% of Americans achieve these recommendations on the consumption of vegetables and fewer than 12% achieve the recommendations on the amount of fruit. And that's how sad it is, right? Fewer than 8% of total calories in America come from fruits and vegetables. And so, um, you know, we're not even touching this. So it's funny because some people, they start a conversation. I was talking to a doctor last night who was like, well, I don't know. The literature is so mixed. And I was like, what are you talking about? Americans aren't even anywhere near right? The recommendations on fruits and vegetables. So to even suggest that like saying you should go all in, you're, you're suggesting that's, that's dangerous or whatever. Absolutely not. The data is robust. And so I say you should be eating predominantly whole minimally processed plant-based foods. And Chef AJ says, amen to that. He says the exact same thing and preaches it from the podium, right? Which is, yeah, you should be eating predominantly whole minimally plant-based foods as your calories. Now, keep in mind, let me give you an example of this. You might say, well, that's what I'm doing. I have a veggie sandwich. Well, here's the problem. When you do the calorie counts on that, that veggie sandwich, the bread is the majority of your calories. The vegetables on that are like this tiny little nothing, right? So if you want to have a slice of all, you know, natural whole wheat, cracked, sprouted bread, whatever, knock yourself out. But if you're going to do that, you also need to have a huge salad and not I'll go, well, I had some bread and I had a little slice of tomato, a little onion and a piece of lettuce. And I count that as eating a lot of fruits and vegetables. That's incorrect. That's a pathetic amount of fruits and vegetables, right? I'm going to call you out on that. We need to be eating massive quantities of this stuff. You want this to be rubbing your insides, right? With this broom of micronutrients, just kind of flooding your cells every time that you eat. Nuts, legumes, and seeds. The AHA recommends at least four servings a week. Whole grains, at least three one ounce equivalent servings a day. Salt less than 1500 milligrams a day. Now you might say, I don't even own a salt shaker, so get off my back. Yet the reality is, look, about 80% of this comes from processed foods. I mean, look, a whole bag of Lay's Classic Potato Chips has the same amount of salt as one slice of whole wheat all natural, you know, Arnold's bread. It's about the same, 170 to 150 milligrams of salt. You don't taste it in the bread because it's mixed in the dough. You taste it on the chips, it's on the outside. Yet your brain says, all right, I'll give up my chips. He wants me to stop eating so much salt. I'll stop eating the chips. I'm just going to have the bread. No, it's not going to cut it. Your blood pressure will still stay elevated. It will not fix it. Just like eating a bunch of tomato sauce that's prefabbed <laughs> in a can ain't going to cut it. So you can get some tomato sauces with no salt that are pre-made, you know, made, but I'd much prefer, even if you don't want to use fresh tomatoes, I'd much prefer you got the Pomodori Pilati, right? The steamed broiled potatoes, skinned, you know, Roma in a can that's BPA-free, organic produce, you know, throw that, you know, chop it all up, throw it in with your onions, garlic, some celery, carrots, saute those babies, throw those tomatoes in, it'll be ready in no time. You know, wonderful sauce. And you got like 20 milligrams of salt in it. Be very conscientious of where, if you're eating in box bags and cans, or as Hans Deal like to say, right, crinkly bags, right, and cans, avoid those, right? That's what we should be doing. And if you're going to eat out of them, be extraordinarily judicious and look carefully. Actually, let's do that one night, Chef AJ. Let's do a label reading class, like with fun, interactive stuff. I've got a fun one of those. We'll do that one week. or That'll be a fun one. But let's break this down. Let's say you've eaten a standard American diet. You go to Chick-fil-A for breakfast burrito, Wendy's for a chicken salad, Chipotle for a beef burrito. Check this out. You're only getting 1,800 calories. That's not that many if you're an active guy mowing lawns all day. But fat is high. Cholesterol should be less than 200, even based on the AHA recommendations. You're double that and more. Sodium should be less than 1500. You're almost four times that. And your fiber is okay. Protein is pretty high. 
But look at that and you go, wow. I mean, that's not even that many calories. That's not even any snacks. There's no Snickers, nothing else in there. And yet you are just blowing up the salt content. Even a veggie burrito at Chipotle is 4,000 something hundred milligrams of salt, right? Be conscientious. You're going to eat out. Just know this. You're going to have bags under your eyes, right? You're going to have swollen fingers, all this nonsense, which tells you you're retaining fluid. Be very aware. Be very sensitive to this. Even if you go out to places like Panera and Olive Garden and Seasons 52, I mean, look at this solid content, 4,670 milligrams. Again, we want to be less than 1,500 milligrams. Cholesterol is still elevated, not as much, but the calorie count is still blah, right? I mean, it's 1,800 calories. So again, people really need to be thinking about this. Your salt is going to be off the chain if you're eating out. And that's something you need to be aware of. It's very rare to find a restaurant where you can go. They do exist. And you can call in advance and you ask for specific things and, you know, just have the steamed vegetables and the steamed white rice and blah, blah. But you've got to be on top of your game. You know, it's fun for me when I love how different people can impact the world for good. A great example of that to me was John McDougall. Uh, love you got to Santa Rosa and you go to any restaurant right back in the day, you go to any restaurant and like literally they would have like a John McDougall menu uh, of that type of food. I loved it. So he had gone around town to all these different restaurants, asking them to essentially have a second page in their, you know, menus uh, for all his people. Because you'd always have hundreds and hundreds of people coming through that city. And, you know, such a, you know, kudos to him for that. And I remember I went to some Thai restaurant and I, you know, and I was like, wow, they've got like a whole... No- back page that says McDougal approved, right? But that's what you need to be doing for yourself. Because remember, you're the CEO of your own health. So you've got to choose and select locations that are going to allow you to achieve vital health and not be compromised constantly. And it may be, in fact, that the best place for you to eat is in your own home the majority of the time. So like this, you make all this food in your own house, check it out now, 1700 calories, right around the same, fat, very low, a third almost of what you had in the others, zero cholesterol, less than a thousand milligrams of salt, double the amount of fiber and still a reasonable amount of protein, right? And again, I mean, it's just, you can eat and eat and eat and eat and eat, beautiful. And yet your numbers, right? This is why people who do my four week program and eat this kind of food, it's just ridiculous. Their blood pressure drops within two weeks, like a rock because you're getting all this excess sodium out. Remember salt does three things. One, appetite stimulant. Two, cause you to retain fluid. Three, damages the glycocalyx. Ooh, that's a cool word. Makes me sound smart like I have an MD. Oh, wait, I do. But a glycocalyx is this unique sort of structure, very delicate fibers all through your blood vessels that keep them open and apart. When you consume a lot of salt, it damages the glycocalyx, making it more likely for that blood vessel to collapse and for heart disease to form with injury to the endothelia. So compare the options. Eat the food that's going to help you achieve your personal goal. If you want to retain fluid, require blood pressure medicine, have diabetes, then choose the first menu options, right? It's that simple. There's no magic here. Eat more fruits, veggies, whole grains, beans, seeds, etc. Avoid the boxes, cans, bags, and crinkly bags. Yeah? And eat less of all the stuff that's going to make you fat, sick, and nearly dead. Lifestyle is very powerful. The question is, which one of these factors is the most powerful? Well, I would argue that the one that is universal, most modifiable, and has multimodal effects, you guessed it, is nutrition, right? Clearly, smoke, don't smoke. Yeah, of course, stop smoking. Exercise, don't exercise. Very powerful, as we've talked about. But nutrition is something we all have to do to survive. You have to eat something, right? And so don't let the excuses of your spouse, of your children, of your personal taste buds, of your finances, of your time, don't let that compromise what's the number one goal, which should be to be healthy. And don't talk to me about finances as long as you're still buying alcohol, right? Still have an iPhone or still buying expensive perfumes, makeup, et cetera. Don't talk to me, right? When you can't afford your makeup or you're getting cheapo depot makeup, now you can talk to me about Right now, you can talk to me about you know it's, that it's too expensive to buy the organic this or the to repair that. But the reality is, for example, when it comes to protein consumption, the cost per gram of protein, if you get it from beans, is nothing compared to the cost of protein derived from beef, for example. So let's remember: you're going to spend some money, spend it wisely in a way that loves you, 
in a way that comp, you know, that gives you the best health possible long term. Nutritional factors that you should focus in on are to reduce or eliminate cholesterol. At this point in my life, I've chosen to eliminate all cholesterol consumption. I have no interest in eating animals and I haven't had dairy for I don't know how long and I don't eat eggs. So if something snuck in here or there in the last couple of years, maybe I did without my knowing it, but certainly not intentionally. Reduce saturated fats, eliminate trans fats, increase your fiber and reduce your sodium. These basic tenets are science-based inherently doable for the majority of us and are powerful interventions. The question becomes, can plant-based nutrition prevent or even reverse heart disease? Well, whenever you think about this, you should say, well, what are the risk factors? How would an intervention help these areas? Well, as it turns out, nutrition can affect each of these. Let's talk about it. Let's start with EPIC, simple studies like this, showing 23,000 participants that if they didn't smoke, they kept their BMI low, they exercised, and they ate a bunch of fruits and veggies, good things happened. How good? Well, they reduced their risk of a heart attack by 80%. They reduced the risk of developing any chronic disease by around 80% when followed over eight plus years. Powerful stuff. What about if you look at other studies from the past, following individuals, looking at their food consumption, seeing their risk of disease? Well, you might find that, for example, vegetarians have half the rate of mortality of the general population and it shows that the biggest reduction in mortality is because of the reduction in heart disease risk. Study after study in plant-based eaters has shown the same thing for decades, since the 1950s, that when you consume more fruits and vegetables and less meat and dairy, you reduce your risk of hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. And as a result, you have less heart disease and you live longer. This is a win and a win. Unless you're not a nice person, then we wish you died early. I'm just making sure you're all listening. <laughs> Next, what about if you took people and you feed them a bunch of junk, like dead animals, or you feed them a bunch of fruits and vegetables, healthy food? And what if you flip them back and forth every couple of weeks? You guessed it. You can either increase pressure or decrease pressure, increase pressure or decrease pressure. That's right. When you consume more animal-based foods, your blood pressure goes up. When you consume more plant-based foods, the blood pressure goes down. Something innately in these foods alters what happens in your body, likely at the gut biome level, where we alter some of this inflammatory cascade and these toxic chemicals are released that increase blood pressure or reduce it. Very interesting stuff. But when you consume a plant-based diet, and here's studies all the way back in the 1970s showing the same thing again and again, you can drop your blood pressure about as much as lisinopril or metoprolol or amlodipine the common drugs used to treat blood pressure. They drop it around five points or so in a low dose. This is a nice John McDougall study from the 1990s. Showed that not only, of course, do you reduce cholesterol, drop weight, and reduce your blood pressure, all kinds of things improve in just 12 days. You know, if you're not ready to commit to a lifetime of joining a cult, I mean, being healthy, well, at least make a commitment to 12 days, or 24, or 31, or 60 days and see what could happen to you. It could be delightful. It could be pretty amazing. I mean, heck, maybe you just make a commitment that the next meal you eat is gonna be a health promoting one. You see, studies at Johns Hopkins showed that a single meal can alter the activity of your endothelia. That's right. You eat a single high fat, high cholesterol meal and it blocks the ability of your blood vessel to dilate to stress by 50% for four hours after the meal. Wow. This is in healthy individuals with no high blood pressure and no high cholesterol. They eat a single high fat meal and their blood vessels are unable to dilate to stress by 50% for four hours. That is insane in the membrane. But the good news is the exact opposite thing occurs when they consume healthy food. And I put up this slide because as many of you know, I do biologic injections. I do PRP and stem cell injections for people with chronic pain. And when I spin people's blood, I take their serum, this is the water and protein content to their bloodstream. This person had eaten a Cuban sandwich and this person a fish sandwich or the other way around. And you can see the lipemia, how cloudy the blood is, the serum is, versus the other two people were plant-based eaters and who had just had salads. You could see how nice and clean the blood looked. So you have to make a decision. Do you want the stuff on the left to run through your bloodstream or the stuff on your right to run through your bloodstream? That's a decision that you have to make with regards to your health. Which one of these do you want? Do you want the 
cholesterol laden, lip lipid rich stuff running through your bloodstream? Or do you want the health promoting stuff? So give me one minute here. Oh. And so then we have obviously this stuff. You can see here, this is someone's serum up on the upper corner on the left. And, and uh, you can see just how toxic looking it is, loaded with cholesterol. And on the other side, we see healthy, right? So this individual who had this serum had just consumed a high fat, high cholesterol meal. This thing below here, it's called a Cobb salad. And you can see all of the blue cheese and eggs and beef and avocado and bacon. They called this thing a salad. And when you go to the nutrition facts on their website, uh, you see, uh, this is a Capitol Grill, you can see 65% of the calories are from pure fat. So this woman had eaten a quote salad thinking she was being healthy. And this is what her blood looked like. Cray cray. Yet how many of you have gone to Cheesecake Factory and eaten a 4,000 calorie salad loaded with feta cheese, avocado, walnuts, olive oil, et cetera, and you think you're having something healthier than the beef? You're not really. You're not. And that's not helpful, right? Not helpful. So here's the answer, right? The answer is you've got to change your behaviors, right? You've got to change your behaviors. Bigger changes, better results. Bigger results, lower risk. And we've seen this, right, with incontrovertible data by the likes of, for example, Dean Ornish, right, who did studies starting in the 1980s, 90s, and 2000s, showing the reversal of heart disease through aggressive nutritional modification. So that individuals who chose to eat a plant-based program, do mindfulness, and spend time in group had radical results in their health, reducing not only their burden of disease, but the cost burden to our society by massive percentage points. The reduction of the need for bypass surgery and the reduction in heart attacks. I mean, just win, 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 win. Amazing, 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 amazing. Again, again, and again, and again, study after study. Same when you look at stuff like the Pritikin program. Here you see beautiful reductions in triglycerides and cholesterol. Beautiful reductions when you see total cholesterol, LDL, so on and so forth. In just three weeks, 80 plus percent of people off their blood pressure medications with normal BPs, right? But now, this is what we want for ourselves. We want healthy numbers, healthy, vital lives. We want our blood vessels wide open. Well, I'm here to tell you that you can have that, but it does require you to radically change likely how you live and what you're eating. Now, I do want to touch briefly upon some of the cool tests that are out there. You know, the basic tests that you're all familiar with, of course, include things like a lipid panel, your CRP that's checking inflammation along with homocysteine, your lipoprotein A and ApoLipoprotein lipoprotein B, which are evaluating your genetic inherited risk for heart disease. These are all valuable things that you should get and kind of understand where your risks are, right? Because if you have a high predisposition of heart disease in your family, and your lipoprotein A and apolipoprotein B are elevated, your homocysteine is up, et cetera, you're a sitting duck for more heart disease. But if all those things are low, wonderful, wonderful. You have greater confidence in what you're doing. I did too want to touch on the topic of TMAO because I think it's fascinating, right? So TMAO, remember, is this molecule that's formed as a result of the consumption of choline or carnitine. And as you saw on this slide, choline, for example, you could see it, the majority of it derived from these animal-based sources, small amount in some plant-based sources, but the overwhelming majority from animal-based sources. And as you consume these foods in your gut, they form what's called trimethylamine. Trimethylamine then circulates to the liver where it's converted tr trimethylamine oxide. Trimethylamine oxide then circulates into the bloodstream where it increases your risk of coronary artery disease by about 400%. That's pretty radical. So as you consume this, right? As you consume choline and carnitine, you increase your risk of producing TMAO and of heart disease. And it's a result of your gut bacteria. That's where it's interesting because if you feed somebody a lot of plants and then give them a piece of meat, they actually produce less TMAO than they would have if they were a standard meat eater. And the reason why is because the type of gut bacteria in you and I heavily influences our ability to produce toxic substances like TMA. Very cool. So again, eating more plants radically can alter and reduce 
right? Your risk of producing toxic chemicals that increase your risk of heart disease. So, and you can read, look at those slides later, but more plants reduces your production of TAMAO, reduces the potential risk of heart disease. Blood pressure, you should check your blood pressure regularly, especially if you have a history of high blood pressure. If not, then you should do it more just for fun. You know, every couple of months, just kind of look at it. I was at Costco, or no, I was, I was in Publix the other day waiting for somebody and I checked mine, right? And I have, a, I have a sphygnometer at home. I check mine every once in a while, just for fun. What about a CT calcium score? I think if you're over the age of 40, it's probably worthwhile to have it once and look at it. I had mine, mine is zero, and I'd like to keep it that way. So validated for me, the choices I've made now in my mid forties, still having a calcium score of zero. Now, if your score is elevated, right, it should prompt you to make radical changes in your nutrition and then repeat that score in about a year and see what's happened. Has it reduced? Is it stable, et cetera? Another test that has no radiation is called a carotid intimal medial thickness test. It's an ultrasound right here. And they look at the thickness, right? The difference of increase between the carotid intimal media sort of relationship, the ratio. And if there is a 10 to 15% increase, in the, then we have an increased risk, right? And so for every 0.1 millimeter increase in the CIMT score. So it's worthwhile getting that. It's something that with no radiation and you can get it done at your local testing center and then repeat it in six months to a year once you're making the advantageous changes in your nutrition. Other things that can be worthwhile dependent upon your symptoms, of course, include EKG, echo stress tests, ultra monitors, et cetera. But don't ignore abnormal rhythms in your heart, feeling like your heart is jumping, skipping beats, right? Like you're losing your breath, you're short of breath, you run or exercise, you're out of breath. It's not acceptable. Don't ignore that. We don't want you to be having a heart attack, right? Like every 37 seconds, someone does. So make sure that you understand your risk, even if you're carotid intimal medial thickness test is good and your apolipoprotein levels are normal, make sure that, you know, if you have abnormal feelings or symptoms, get them worked up and figure it out. So in closing, heart disease, the leading cause of death for you and I, directly linked, directly linked. I want to say that again. Heart disease is directly linked to the food, exercise, stress, and toxins you're exposed to. You need to hear this because it gives you the empowerment to take control, because that's what this is about. You maximizing your health, maximizing your vitality. You need to make radical changes in your nutrition and they will result in radical changes in your risk. Test, don't guess, don't assume things, right? But really understand your personal risk. What's your blood pressure? What's your cholesterol? What's your hemoglobin A1C, right? What are all those other markers that I talked to you about, the inflammatory markers, et cetera? You need to know those. So here's your recommendation. If you're over 40, check your blood pressure at least once a month. Get your lipid panel at least once a year. Check your lipo A, APO B. Check your calcium score. Check your CIMT once as baseline, once every three years if you're at high risk. Take a photo of that and do those things to reduce your risk, right, over time. So I'm going to open up some questions in a minute, but I just want to remind you that you are on this powerful journey of health and what you do matters. So keep on going. Test, don't guess. And join me, if you would, I'd love to have you join me on Instagram or Facebook at Esser Health. Love to have more people that I can share this message with, hopefully in an inspirational and positive way. So as always, thank you, Chef AJ, for the chance to join you. And I'm open to any and all questions on topics related to health but not on finance. I'm not a good finance guy. <laughs> oh, those are the questions I had. No, just kidding. Yeah. That was interesting okay. that, that watching a team, a sports team. Yes. Can, a multitude is- of studies repeating this, showing this. One of the early ones, it was a lot of fun. It was done in Germany when Germany was in the World Cup. And they had this last five years of data and compared the exact days per year uh, to the days that when they were in the World Cup, when they were Germany was playing, there was this huge spike of MIs, of myocardial infarctions of heart attacks, every night that they played. It was fascinating to see. So, you know, the level of stress, enthusiasm, and excitement, as well as likely the consumption of high fat, high cholesterol, unhealthy foods during the party atmosphere, right? The, the dual, you know, danger. Well, I'm glad I'm not a sports fan then. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you. Uh, we have about 10 questions that were submitted in advance. I'll try to get the ones on heart disease first. And this first one says, can you please ask Dr. Esser whether having a high resting heart rate is considered a factor for heart disease? Well, it's considered an increased risk 
over time for things like congestive heart disease, right? Or congestive heart failure, right? If you're overworking the heart, because if your resting heart rate is already elevated, then likely your exercising heart rate will be elevated as well. So if you have a resting heart rate that is elevated chronically, you want to look at the factors like, are you dehydrated, right? That's the first thing to look at. Is it a medication or supplement side effect? Are you drinking excess amounts of caffeine or taking caffeinated supplements? Um, is your thyroid off, right? Some other hormonal imbalance uh, like a hyperthyroid state. Uh, these are important because we want to have a lower heart rate on average because it increases it, forgive me, it decreases the workload on the heart and can also be a sign of better autonomic balance. Remember, there are two automatic things going on in our bodies. There is the parasympathetic rest and digest, and there is the sympathetic fight or flight. These two portions of the uh, sort of nervous system are constantly trying to find balance. If your resting heart rate is elevated, it, well, we want to know, is it a hormonal, right? Is it a, you know, dehydration? Is it some other issue? Or is it just straight up an autonomic problem? that you are chronically in a state of stress, fear, anxiety. So I want to address that, look into it and determine what the cause is. I just took mine while you were talking and it was about 54. Is that good? I love it. Yeah. I mean, the average resting heart rate is 60 to hundred or so. We'd like to see it, right? The healthy and even well-conditioned individual uh, below that 60 mark, if and when possible. She says hers, uh, hers is 80, high 80s to 90s. Her mom's is very hard, thyroid function normal. And she wanted to know if an exercise regimen like cardio would really help lower it that much, or do you have to be a professional cyclist to have a low resting heart rate? She is currently out of shape, BMI 28. Yeah. So the first thing to say is, right, if you're over the age of 45 and the BMI of 28 and you've eaten the standard American diet, you want to get a good uh, sort of screen before you start exercising aggressively. Mild exercise, like gently walking or even borderline moderate exercise, like walking with a little, so a little light, you know, kind of have to breathe a little bit is okay. But if you're wanting to push yourself to actually achieve a better cardiovascular endurance level, I'd recommend that you get a workup first. So I'd have your lipids checked, I'd have your thyroid checked, I'd get an EKG, um, you know, all the things that should be done according to the American College of Sports Medicine uh, prior to really ramping up your exercise. But to answer your question, yes, if you exercise at a moderate level chronically, several days per week, you should expect that your average resting heart rate will go down. Perfect. Thank you. This question is about the waist circumference in females, how risky is it to have one over 35 inches? Can you please give analogies as to how important or risky it is? Yeah, I mean, I can't speak to the exact statistical data, right? That might compare that to smoking or other things. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm happy to look that up and I'll post it on Instagram. So go look for that in the next day. Uh, we can try to see what the actual statistical analysis shows. Uh, but certainly having that increase in visceral fat is very dangerous because your visceral or belly fat releases adipokines. So if you go back to one of my talks on musculoskeletal medicine, for example, we know that the visceral fat releases these cytotoxic chemicals constantly throughout the day and night. And these little molecules called adipokines circulate through the bloodstream and damage your heart, your blood vessels, your joints, your ligaments, everything. And so it's absolutely essential to reduce that visceral or belly fat because that is the dangerous toxic fat. So don't, uh, I'm glad that you're asking that question. I'm so excited you're watching this show with Chef AJ and spending time on her channel. Uh, you need to make that a priority. And the best way to do that is to follow Chef AJ's recommendations on a calorie density model of eating, right? That low calorie density model, right? Get some of her books, follow her programs, buy my four week detox online, download it, do my program, whatever. But do it, get that fat down now, don't wait. And yes, it's crucial to do so for your heart disease risk long-term. Great, thank you. Uh, so Jean wanted to know, as a postmenopausal woman, she's concerned about information or mixed information regarding how excessive supplemental calcium and vitamin D might increase the risk of existing atrial fibrillation. Any thoughts? Oh, that's a great, that's right. I have a whole talk on supplements. That's another one we need to do, Chef AJ. We haven't done. Um, so uh, the studies are clear. There are multiple small and large studies combined all together in a meta-analysis published in the last couple of years that shows that if you consume supplemental calcium as calcium oxide or calcium other forms, uh, you increase your risk of a heart attack by up to 15%. Wow. Not cool. So not, totally not, not cool. So why does that happen? Well, it turns out that your body takes the calcium with the cholesterol 
forms atherosclerotic plaques, if you will, and that's what happens. It essentially stores that cholesterol and calcium together in the lining of your arteries, and there's your heart disease. So we no longer recommend, in fact, the American Preventive Task Force Association, or by APTSF, whatever that is, um, they made the recommendation to no longer take calcium. You should not be taking calcium by itself. It does nothing of great value for you. You should be eating foods that are rich in calcium, all your deep greens and your figs and all these other wonderful things. You should not be consuming calcium by itself in a supplemental form. If you are osteopenic or parotic and you're looking to strengthen your bones, you should be consuming vitamin D, vitamin K2, looking at your thyroid hormones, doing your strength training, all this good stuff. But eating the calcium in the form that it comes most average in, which is a powdered form of oyster shells, increases your risk of a heart attack. So don't do it. Stop. Great. Perfect. I, I don't know if uh, I told you about this new spice. He's like bacon. Oh, I saw that on your Instagram page. There. Tasty. So Victoria <laughs> says, <laughs> uh, several years ago, I had an aortic dissection prior to surgery. I'd been eating a vegetarian diet for about three decades. Afterwards, when I asked what I could do to improve the results of my carotid artery ultrasound, my doctor shook his head very solemnly and told me I couldn't and to go home and enjoy my life. In the past couple of years, I decided to take matter into my own hands and also eliminated dairy and eggs from my diet. I want to be optimistic, not the doom and gloom I heard before I have my next scan. Am I foolish to think that at 76 years old, eating this way, I'm on a better road to healing my body and benefiting my carotid artery and all of my arteries? No, you're not foolish and you're brilliant. You should keep going. And the data and the science validates that as long as you got a heart beat and a breath, what you do matters. And if you're curious, go get a CIMT test and you know you can just get it done. Uh, a lot of these tests, you don't even need a doctor's refer, you don't even need insurance to pay for, right? You may pay a hundred bucks or 200 bucks or whatever. Like for example, a, a CT calcium score here in Jacksonville is 99 bucks cash. And so, you know, you can just get it and know, right? So if you get that CIMT test um, and, you know, the ultrasound and then repeat it in three to six months and see if it's changed at all. So keep on going and don't listen to the naysayers. Uh, because the reality is what you do matters. Remember the study I showed you from Johns Hopkins, and they've repeated that study multiple times, showing the exact same thing again and again. But if you took people and fed them spinach or blueberries, their blood vessels dilated. If you fed them heavy, you know, high cholesterol, high fat meals, the, the arteries constricted, done, end of story. So yes, your endothelia are still alive and they are still modifiable. Thank you. This one has been pre-submitted, but it's not about heart disease, but I think it's a subject you treat or know about. It's from Maud. And she said, most of the knuckles on my hands have ganglion cysts. What causes them and what can I do about them? I will not have surgery or be injected. I've been following a whole food plant-based diet since 2020, but maybe I have something wrong. So small cysts are usually collections of some of the articular fluid, I meaning the joint fluid kind of pushes out and forms these little cysts. And genetics seem to play a part in this as well as trauma or injury to the knuckles of the hands. And uh, so, you know, if they're large, often you can actually just aspirate them or drain them under ultrasound guidance. If they're small, then using various topical creams like Arnica gel, capsaicin, or other soothing topicals sometimes calms down any pain related to them. If they're non-painful, well, then they're just sort of an aesthetic thing. And, uh, you know, it is what it is. Uh, usually when there's been a significant anatomic deformity, uh, then consuming a plant-based diet is unlikely to radically change that, right? So if you, you know, have severe end-stage osteoarthritis of your knees, you are unlikely to suddenly grow new cartilage just because you ate a bunch of lettuce, but you are likely to have less inflammation in the knees, right? And for the degeneration to slow, those are two different things. Nice. Uh, this one uh, is from Amanda. And she said, Dr. Esser, can you talk about lipoprotein A? I just learned that my number is 322. That's my birthday, which is quite high that it is difficult to lower and can be hereditary. I'm a 34 year old female vegan and my biological father died of heart disease at 54. Thanks in advance. Yeah. I mean, the first thing I'd start out with is identifying your risk. It sounds like you're getting some of the genetic tests, which is great. I'd also get some of the anatomic tests like that CIMT test. And even if you have a high family history of heart disease, perhaps even that calcium CT score, um, you can wait till you're 40 to do it, which is the usual recommendation, or you could go now. I think also looking at markers of inflammation, I think are gonna be very important for you. Uh, because if you recall from the study or what I said about atherosclerotic formation, but those three risk factors, right? Elevated cholesterol, chronic inflammation, endothelial damage. So you wanna have a multi-pronged approach for your general health and then track the outcomes over time. 
So looking at that lipid profile, inflammation markers, and you know tracking kind of the genetic you know sort of risk factors, but then looking at anatomic you know evidence for heart disease and carotid artery disease that forms, as well as maximizing all the other factors, the exercise, the sleep, the emotional poise, that helps to keep kind of these you know uh, risk factors in the healthiest place possible. Great. Thanks. This one's on cancer. So I don't know if you know the answer. You did do a wonderful talk on the greens and blues of cancer last month from MJ. She says she's been diagnosed with a chronic blood cancer, but she's been cancer free for the last two years. Thankfully, her hematologist tells her that this type of leukemia usually returns every five to seven years on average. What is the best nutritional advice to help prevent the leukemia from coming back again? So depending upon the type of leukemia, you know, there are several that respond beautifully to aggressive nutritional modifications. Dr. Alan Goldhammer and the team out of, I think it was UCLA, published two nice case reports in our case series of individuals with a specific type of leukemia, or perhaps it was lymphoma, we'd have to go back and look. Um, actually, I can look while we're talking. And long story short is by um, doing a short uh, therapeutic, you know, water-only fast, and then going on a strict plant-based program, uh, they actually were able to completely resolve uh, this blood cancer that the individual had and long-term follow-up uh, demonstrated resolution. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, knowing exactly what you have, I think is very important. Yeah, theirs was a stage 3A low-grade lymphoma. So I just pulled it up, the study. But uh, so probably different than what you've been experiencing if you have a leukemia. But I think, you know, chatting with somebody like Dr. Goldhammer could always be a win. He often does, uh, you know, kind of uh, free consultations over the phone if you want to see if coming to his center might be something worthwhile for you. So True North Health, healthpromoting.com you can go to, or is it healthpromoting.org? No, I think it's .com. Well, I, you know, I want to respect your time. There's a few more questions, but you're a busy working doctor. So you just tell me when to stop. Let's do three more if you've got them and then we'll go. Oh my God, that's so funny because that's, I think that's exactly how many there are. Isn't that interesting? Okay, uh, that were pre-submitted. So sorry, guys, if I can't take it from the chat, you do need to send them in in advance. I just had it pulled up. I'm so sorry, my little You're thing. Good. That's all right. My sweet potato fries and big salad are calling my name. Oh my goodness. Oh, that's right. Really? You're now you, you thought you were, you were four hours earlier, but you're actually three hours <laughs> late. So that was the thing about that. when that's we. Right. So funny. I do have a photo for you, Chef AJ. See that? That was on my property today. Look at that little cutie. Looks, little, like little... New, looks like a newborn. I know. I was out there weed eating and multiple little bunnies ran off in different directions. And so I caught one and had my daughter hold it. They were so cute. So oh, adorable. So right? adorable. Yeah. You, you don't know, you mentioned in your talk about maybe doing a talk about label reading, but if we eat foods without labels, we don't need to talk about label reading. Boom, shakalaka, talks over, done. <laughs> You're funny. This is from Janet, and she wants to know if red light therapy with a home FDA approved machine is a safe and effective way to deal with shoulder and leg pain. Well, so there's a percentage of people who the red light therapy seems to really benefit them. Remember what it does is it increases blood flow, right? Which brings more nutrients to the region and, and also brings in things like platelets and stem cells to help with healing. Uh, so the studies on red light therapy do show, for example, wounds heal a little bit faster, pain decreases, et cetera. But, you know, I'm always hesitant to recommend people to spend thousands of dollars on a, you know, a device for their own home, uh, because again, the data is not that robust. But if they've already maximized their nutrition, their sleep, their exercise, all these basics, and they want to try to add in the red light therapy, um, I'm not opposed to it. If they have an acute injury and they want to use red light therapy, uh, you know, in a clinic or somewhere like that, very reasonable to trial as well. Again, for some people, it's helpful. Thanks. Deb says, what exercise can you recommend for elbow pain? Depends on the elbow. So elbows, right? This is a complex joint. You can have medial, lateral, posterior, anterior elbow pain. And so the first place to start is getting a good diagnosis. Uh, so is it lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow? Is it a radial tunnel syndrome? Is it, you know, is it bad arthritis in your elbow? Is it a UCL injury? There's so many. So first off, get a good diagnosis, see a good sports, you know, medical doctor or a good physical therapist, and then come up with a game plan. 
Love it. And we do have a physical therapist on every month. So if you'd like to bring that question back to her, Deb, you can also. Last question from Diana. She said, I've recently heard about an osteoarthritis treatment offered throughout Europe and the UK called MBST, Magnetic Resonance Therapy. My understanding is that it's a therapy device that treats the targeted tissue directly over a period of five to 10 sessions. Can Dr. Esser explain how this therapy works and whether it's an effective alternative to the other treatments available would you recommend it if pain persists despite adherence to the pillars of lifestyle medicine? Well done. Good question. And so, you know, kind of many of these different forms of treatment like MDST are intended to stimulate the body's own healing cascades. Um, and the question just always is, well, how uh, you know, powerful are these therapies? And, you know, while there is some reasonable um, sort of data, you know, lab data wise, I don't know of any good sort of randomized controlled trials uh, where individuals were randomized to either MBST, um, you know, versus, you know, standard exercise and, you know, and then the outcomes that they have. So I can certainly research that a little bit more uh, and see kind of, uh, you know, what those studies show. Uh, right now, there are a number of different, um, you know, organizations that, or people, I should say, who try to market or sell different treatments with different lights, with different laser, with different things of that sort of th stuff. Um, you know, and the, the question just is, is it really helping the patient that much in comparison, or is it just helping the provider make more money, right? So MBST, there are a number of small studies, I'm actually even on right now looking, um, versus, you know, physiotherapy versus, you know, the MBST, et cetera. And, you know, the outcomes are present that there is some slight improvement. Um, what we have to always do is then break down those studies and see if they directly relate to people like you with the problem that you have, right? But there are only probably about two or three studies that actually look at that question. And so I think from my perspective, I have a sliding scale of evidence for everything. If something's going to cost a lot of money or has high risk, you need more data. If it's low risk, low cost, fine, use it, try it, Right. So just be aware of that, right? That many of these treatments, it's $300 per visit or 200 or a thousand or buy a package of 1600. Well, okay, how much is this actually gonna help me compared to if I just do the rehab that I should be doing uh, on my own? Right, so well, Dr. Esser, this was great. Thank you. You mentioned you had a supplement talk. If you'd like to do that next month, of course, you can talk about anything. Let's do it, let's do it. Let's do the science of supplementation. Right, because so many people keep thinking they need to take a DHA supplement, and even cardiologists, plant-based ones now are recommending olive oil, so I'd love to know your thoughts next month. We'll talk. I like it. Thank you, Dr. Esser. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye, and thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 9 a.m. Pacific time for Chef John from Faux Fresh, and he's going to be talking about how he makes the most delicious Vietnamese SOS-free food. Take care, everyone. Make sure you sign up so you can get your questions, too, answered by.